some seasonal forecasts can still be just plain wrong. This year's winter was deemed most likely to be mild. So how did that happen? This is why accurate forecasting matters, so we can all prepare. In fact, that seasonal forecast predicting a mild winter wasn't actually wrong, but it left people with a wrong impression. Because forecasting much further ahead than a few days is all about probabilities and risk. It's not definitive. So what we do is we forecast the risk of a cold winter, and the risk of a cold winter, according to the forecast, was one in five at the beginning of winter. That does not mean that you're not going to get a cold winter. It exactly means that the chance of a cold winter is one in five. Weather systems are hugely complex and chaotic. Forecasters are trying to balance the influence of lots of different interacting factors. In the Northern Hemisphere, one important influence is a phenomenon known as the Arctic Oscillation. This is the interaction between two atmospheric pressure patterns. The first is called the positive phase, where there's relatively low pressure over the polar region, which brings warmer, wetter weather. The second is called the negative phase, when there's high pressure over the polar region, driving cold air southwards. This is what we're experiencing now in an extreme version. What this means is record low temperatures compared to the average in higher latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, such as the UK, China and Asia, but record highs compared to average in lower latitudes, such as the Mediterranean. The Arctic Oscillation varies over time. Here you see it switching from positive to negative, from red to blue. The problem is there's no apparent pattern to this switching. With the Arctic Oscillation, um, over the last decades, actually, it's been more in a, in a warming phase. Um, although we have seen, as we came into the autumn of this year in September, it moved into a, a negative phase, which signals cold weather, then back into warm again, and then in mid-December back into cold. So it is difficult to predict it a long way ahead because it does fluctuate through the year. Today I visited the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. It generates global weather data which it passes on to national Met offices across Europe so they can create their own forecasts. It is home to the largest computer system for weather forecasting in the world. Is it fair to say that forecasters didn't see this cold snap coming? It is, would be fair to say that uh, concerning the seasonal forecast range, so typically a few months in advance, and clearly in this case we didn't have such a signal. When it comes to shorter range, clearly one month ahead we already had such a signal in the model of this organisation and we could see uh, the cold periods uh, almost uh, one month ago. All this is hard for the public to take in. When we looked at the Met Office website today, the seasonal forecast published in December seems to indicate that from January to March, the UK falls under orange, the warmest classification. Confusing at the very least. I think businesses who use weather forecasts commercially are used to that and have been using probability forecasts for some years. But we haven't really brought that into the public weather forecasts yet. And, and I think that's something that's going to come over the next few years. So you think that needs to happen? I think it definitely needs to happen, yes. Given the difficulties of modelling these complex weather systems, some people are beginning to ask, how accurate are the models for climate change? And can we really trust those to predict the future? Fluctuations like this in the UK climate do not map very strongly onto the global mean climate. And actually the skill in predicting annual global mean temperatures is much higher. It is a much easier job than predicting, say, the winter mean temperature for the UK. But forecasters have a mountain to climb in getting the public to understand the complexities of weather forecasting and what these can and can't tell us. Susan Watts, I'm joined now by Keith Groves from the Met Office and by Patrick Mishari, who is a specialist in forecasting and risk at Oxford University. Why didn't you see this coming? I'm disappointed that our seasonal forecast didn't give a prediction or a stronger probability of a cold winter. But by the middle of December, and in fact on the 10th of December, we started to give our first forecasts that we were heading for colder weather and we were 
emphasizing that more and more as we went but through it December. It snowed on the 18th of December. I mean, most of us could have predicted by then by looking out the window. But we still were able to give a reasonably good prediction of the amount of snow and where that snow was going to fall before Christmas. And in fact, we gave some very accurate predictions in the shorter range forecasts up to five days ahead. What, what do you make of you know, the map? That, I've got a copy of it here that Susan showed, which that shows orange and suggests that we would have above normal temperatures, that warm was more likely. I mean, should we take these things with a bit of a pinch of salt? I think you have to be very careful how you use this information because also in that there would be a 25 to 30 percent probability of having a colder than normal winter and in fact if you look at the last 10 years we've only actually had one winter that has been colder than normal so actually looking at the statistics of the last 10 years we were actually indicating a marginally higher probability of a cold winter. What do, you, what do you make of this? Because I, I think we're talking about probabilities here and I, you know I, I'm not aware when I hear a weather forecast people say there's a 30% chance I might get this right. I think, I think there's a real mismatch between the, the output of the models which essentially can provide probabilistic information and the sort of real need that decision makers like to converge everything down to a single number and when you take an average you throw away all of that information about the fact that there are things that can happen in the tail of the distribution so essentially if, if, if that information could be provided in a more statistical way I think people would be more open to, to the shock of things going wrong. But do you, do you think we would get that as, as viewers and listeners of the Met forecast because I mean I, I do notice in American weather forecasts they do say there's a 30 percent probability of showers. Yeah. Viewers there seem to get it. Yeah I, I think people would be would be very open and, and it would be much easier then to to understand when when things don't turn out as they were forecasted they would be able to go back and see there was a percentage is that chance. something you, you could look at? Absolutely, we are, we are looking at it. We have got some experimental products on our website that express the forecast in probabilistic terms. And I think that's a much more intelligent and educated way to convey the uncertainty and the risks in our forecast. But, you, you know, all of us remember it was supposed to be a barbecue summer last summer and it rained a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the simple headline was, was wrong. Yes, as I say, I'm disappointed. I'd love it if our seasonal forecasts were as accurate as our short period forecasts. And I have to say, I think we've done a fantastic job in forecasting the detail of the snow in the short range. But yes, we have got a long way to go with developing the seasonal forecasting capability. We've only been doing it for a very few years. And there is skill. There's some real benefit around the world in the information that we provide in those seasonal forecasts. I want to see them to be much more accurate but, for the UK. And you would give us probabilities. You would give us percentages. Absolutely, you, absolutely uh, yes. I, I mean, is, is there anybody that does it better? Is there, is there one country or another place which would do it better than we do? Or are, are all Met offices in the same kind of boat in this? I think, yeah, I think everyone's in, in the same boat. That The only, the only accurate way to, to provide forecasts is, is using probabilistic information. But I think, again, the job comes down to the media, the way that information is presented to the end users. And, and I think more and more people actually would, would prefer to have that information. But if you, you know, if you leave it to the media to talk about probability, you're never going to get anywhere, are you? I mean, what we, what we need is the, is the Met office to tell us that this is 60% chance yeah, of being to put, wrong. To, to put hard numbers on these things wouldn't, wouldn't, would be a good idea. I, I, but will you actually do this? Well, we do it. We do. We but not, not on the weather forecast. Most of us, you know, maybe on your website. But, you, mm. but, you, but even on the website, that is quite misleading, isn't it? Because it does suggest above normal temperatures more likely for January. Yeah, but there was other additional information that went with, with that that expressed the forecast in the terms of probabilities of, of, of colder than normal, near normal and above normal. Do, do, do you, either of you think that there is a, a big knock-on effect here in the sense that those people who are already sceptical about global warming will say, well, you know, if you can't forecast what's going to happen next month, how are you going to know what's going to happen in 50 years? I, I think there's a, a danger of that happening, and I think it's, I guess it is very much in, in you know, the scientists' position to actually show that there's a big difference between forecasting weather and then forecasting climate change. It's a totally different model, totally different timescales, totally different areas of, of well, the globe. Kind of, but I mean sitting at home you might think oh, I, I, I just don't get that you know what, what, if you can't tell me if it's going to snow next month why, why how are you going to tell me that there's going to be three feet of water in London in 50 years time? Yeah but it, it, you know if you look at the actual scientific details of what's you know what's been attempted to to be calculated there is a huge difference 
Um, if you go back to you know, before someone generates a forecast, they have to validate the model. They have to make sure it, it adds up to being able to predict the, the historical events that have gone beforehand. And if it's able to do that, then you have some confidence that it will actually work into the future. Does that, does that worry you? No, I, I, I totally agree with Patrick. I mean, we do validate our climate models. And there is the, to, to actually reproduce the change in temperature that we've seen in the last 100 years, the only way you can do that is by adding carbon dioxide into the model. So we have, we have real confidence in the skill of our climate model to, to replicate the global climate as we move forward. That's completely different to trying to forecast the variability on one month or two month or a season ahead. It's a completely different application of the science. Okay, thank you both very much.